Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have Tina Kanyashvili here today uh, at the joint P BTPC CFPU seminar. Uh, Tina has faculty positions at Ilya State University in Georgia and also at Carnegie Mellon University. And she's interested in a range of topics that include theoretical cosmology, uh, cosmic rays and fluid dynamics. And today she's gonna tell us about her recent work on uh, circular polarization of gravitational waves from early universe turbulence sources. Yes, thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, I would like just to thank uh, Stefan for inviting for this seminar. And um, so I will talk about uh, basically two papers of which uh, I have worked with uh, Axel Branderburg, Gigaro Beridze, Artur Kosowski, Cheyenne Mandal, and Alberto Robert Paul. So Cheyenne Mandal and Alberto, they both defended their PhD uh, last spring. Okay. So outline of the talk will be the following. So first I will talk about the primordial gravitational waves from the phase transition and explicitly turbulence. After I will refer to the magnetic to hydrodynamical turbulence, MHD turbulence, and show why it is so important. I will briefly go through the numerical simulation and the gravitational wave signal itself. And after I will switch to the circular polarization of these gravitational waves and after to the detection prospects, right? So everyone knows that uh, why these gravitational waves astronomy is so, mm, important for the cosmology and physics and fundamental science in Hull. Uh, and it has an advantage that the gravitational waves uh, propagate it almost freely uh, from the moment of their generation. And at this point, they can retain the information about the uh, very, very early moments of the universe, even the birth of the universe. And uh, as they can, um, gives us uh, clues what kind of the physics, if it, if it is some new physics at the very high energy. Uh, the advantage of the gravitational waves at astronomy it is because it is quite difficult to detect both ways directly or indirectly, right? So oh, for, uh, so my, um, Topic uh, of today topic, it is about the relict gravitational waves. And there is a several sources in the early universe, starting from the very, very early times inflation. Uh, also, it is possible to have gravitational signal uh, through the topological defects and strings, and uh, also cosmological phase transition, for example, electroweak or QCD uh, phase transition. So this is the last what I will be focusing more, right? So we know that uh, through the bubble collisions of the first order phase transition, we can get the gravitational waves. Also recently it was realized that um, sound waves and density perturbation during the phase transition can give you a um, quite strong source of the primordial gravitational waves. And as a, like my interest was uh, mostly focused on the hydrodynamical and magnetohydrodynamical turbulence. Now, uh, just uh, to recall that uh, the gravitational wave wavelengths are diluted uh, uh, during the expansion of the universe. And here it is uh, some mm, relation for the amplitude and for the uh, frequencies. Uh, and uh, as you see, I normalized everything to the 100 GVs because uh, purpose, uh, it is because I would like to connect this one to the electrovic um, energy scales in the universe. So also I will talk about the uh, gravitational waves polarization. And if there was a party violation in the early universe, then the gravitational waves will be circularly polarized. And Stefan made a pioneering contribution to this field. 
to studying the circular polarization of the primordial gravitational waves. So here it is um, point masses, how they react when the gravitational waves plus and cross linearly polarized going through them. Uh, so here, as we can see, there is a completely um, preserved the parity, while on the cross one, we have the symmetry, uh, but through the 45 degrees. And here it is also showing the schematically how the, this point mass is uh, located at the sphere will be um, Will, will be affected by the path of the gravitational waves. Of course, the gravitational waves are very weak, so this is an exaggerated picture, right? And uh, importantly, I should mention that if we go to the standard model, we do not have polarized gravitational waves. Now, why is um, electroweak scales and why LISA? So when the LISA laser interferometer space antenna was designed, it was designed just to uh, detect the mergers of the supermassive black holes. Uh, but after it was realized that uh, LISA's peak sensitivity corresponds to the one tenth of the Hubble horizon at the one TV range, and uh, it is around 10 minus four uh, Hertz. Uh, if it is normalized to one TV. And uh, this will be another option, additionally to the Large Hadron Collider to see the new physics at the scales, at the electro weak phase transition scales, right? So this um, subject, the generation of the gravitational waves through the phase transition, was discussed even in the 1973 by the paper of the Vinicur. After it was addressed by Hogan, uh, Turner, and Wilczek in the 90s. And I believe that first paper in which the, everything was done quantitatively was Kosowski, Turner, and Watkins in uh, 92. Here it is the snapshots of this paper, which was published in the FISRA letters. Uh, and after there is, was a series of the papers uh, by Kosovsky and collaborators. Now, on this uh, picture, which I adopted from the Hogan paper in 2006, it is showing that the phase transition uh, are detected by the laser interferometer space antenna. Uh, and, uh, uh, but in all cases, it assumes that uh, the phase transitions are first order, and we know that probably electrovic and QCD uh, phase transitions both are just crossover, not the first order, right? So if, for example, uh, these bubble collisions will be confirmed by the detection of the gravitational waves, it will be also having the indications that we are dealing with the first order phase transition, right? So the physics of this generation of the gravitational waves, so when there is a first order phase transition, the bubble collide, nucleate, and these um, violent processes produce you the gravitational waves, right? So here, if you go to the cutting at all web pages, you will see a very nice numerical simulations of these phase transition bubble collisions. So as I, as I said, recently, like five years ago, uh, it was realized that a density perturbation during this first order phase transition can induce uh, gravitational waves. And uh, this was like uh, works by Mark Heidmarsh and collaborators. And by the way, the picture of their numerical simulations is used for the um, profile and the uh, picture for the cosmology group of the LISA consortium. So uh, now I'm just saying about the primordial turbulence and 
In fact, I first time came to the United States supported by National Science Foundation uh, through like our collaboration with Arthur Kosowski. And we have worked out um, to describe the gravitational waves coming not only from the bubble collisions, but from the turbulence which follows these bubble collisions, right? Uh, so, and after in 2005, uh, we discussed the possibility to get the circular pol polarized gravitational waves in the case if we do have the parity violating sources. Uh, Nicholas in 2004, he estimated what will be the signal strength from this uh, primordial hydrodynamical turbulence. And he sees that the for a strong phase transition, uh, this will be detectable by LISA. So these alpha parameters gives uh, us uh, insight what it is a strength of this uh, first order phase transition and uh, what portion of the uh, vacuum energy goes to the uh, to, uh, uh, to to the gravitational waves after this uh, bubble collisions also. So there is a two parameters which determine the strength of the gravitational waves. One will be alpha parameter, and another one will be the time during which these phase transitions occurs. Now. Uh, when I have worked on this analytically on this uh, turbulence generated gravitational waves, uh, the averaging time averaging procedure is a sort of the difficult. And my colleague from Georgia, Gigago Berida, who was working previously on the sound wave generation from the turbulence told me, look, what you are considering was completely solved already in the aerodynamics in the 50s. So this uh, um, papers by Lighthill and Proudman in 52. So here it is a uh, uh, question which describes the sound wave generation by the turbulent source, right? So, and we definitely know that uh, this turbulence produces sound waves, the same way it produces gravitational waves. So we can, I just, I just wrote these two equations separately, just show you how they are similar. So the above equation, it is um, equation for the sound waves. Delta rho corresponds to density fluctuations and C sub S uh, corresponds to the uh, sound speed, propagation speed of these sound waves. For the gravitational waves, assuming that my speed of the light is one, uh, I will get the equation very similar to this one. However, on the right hand side, we will have transverse and traceless um, projected source, right? Because the metric perturbations, gravitational waves are transverse and traceless. So I need to project my source for it, right? So as you can see, the equations are really, really similar to each other. And if now I will assume that I can just introduce two, two components of the gravitational waves, cross and plus, as I have shown, the equations became like completely the same, right? So I don't need any more to have these indexes. Now, uh, based on this analogy uh, with Gigago Berize in 2007, we just done uh, the same procedure as it was done in the aeroacoustic approximation for the stationary turbulence. Why I'm just saying this one, this is a main stone that for the analytical purposes, uh, we assumed that the turbulence is stationary and follows the Kolmogorov flow. In fact, as I will discuss, this is uh, not the case in the uh, real production of the gravitational waves by the turbulence following the phase, uh, phase transition. So here again, it is the gravitational waves equation. This is a solution for this equation, which is depends of course on the source term. And uh, the resulting gravitational waves in, through this approximation will be dependent on how long the turbulence lasts, 
what it is uh, string, uh, string scale, so the typical scale of the source, what it is in Mach number, so how um, fast are the turbulent motions, and what it is the Reynolds numbers, which determines uh, uh, where there is the dumping due down dumping of source due to the viscosities, right? So uh, introducing all these parameters here, we have estimated what will be the typical frequency of gravitational waves and what will be the amplitude. So here it is a picture from this paper and uh, the solid lines uh, corresponds to the analytically computed while the dotted line, as you can see for here, right, for the Mach number one, which is extreme case, you never have the, for the uh, fluid motion, the speed of the light, of course. So with this extre extremal case, you will have that a slight deviation from the analytical estimation. But again, this was done everything through the approximations that turbulence is stationary and described by the Kolmogorov-like law, right? Now, why is a helical uh, magnetohydrodynamical turbulence? So uh, since um, early universe is a perfect conductor, uh, and since there is a fluid motions, we should estimate that should be the, some magnetic fields also there. Uh, just for example, generated. And in fact, in uh, 55, Kulstrud uh, considered what will be the effects of the sound wave generation by turbulence if we assume the presence of the magnetic field. So, inspired by the same uh, motivations, we considered what will be happens if we do have the cosmic magnetic field and what will be the signal uh, coming from uh, such kind of the turbulence. And also we went a bit um, further. We assumed that the source is parity violating. So we do have the magnetic helicity. So what we have seen that uh, we can split uh, the processes in the two cases. One, when it is a direct cascade, like Kolmogorov-like, and the second one was inverse cascade, which is a characterized, which characterizes uh, helical uh, magnetohydrodynamics. So this is also important for my second part. But again, there was uh, assumed that the turbulence lasts long enough, and it is stationary. So, so now you will tell me from where uh, comes this motivation to consider seed magnetic fields. And in fact, uh, we know that magnetic fields are everywhere uh, on the sun, on the magnetostar, on uh, clusters, galaxies, on Earth, everywhere. But the production of these uh, fields can be explained through the astrophysical processes and amplification of the seed fields, right? Uh, but uh, recently it was uh, uh, claimed in 2000, recently, I mean 10 years ago, Neronov and Volk, they published the paper uh, in Science claiming that the Fermi LAT observation of the Blaster spectra indicates that there is a uh, lower limit for the extragalactic magnetic fields correlated on the very large scales around one megaparsec. And it will be sort of the difficult to explain uh, such a field in the voids, right? Because in the voids, we do not have the uh, interstellar medium, which can be like uh, affect somehow this magnetic field amplifications. So here it is, this picture, this dashed uh, regions corresponds to the lower limits. And the upper limits corresponds to the limits on the um, magnetic fields coming from the cosmic microwave background radiation, from the Faraday rotations, and the nucleosynthesis. Now, if I uh, look on these pictures, uh, first it was predicted 10 minus 15 
uh, Gauss magnetic field at one megaparsec scales. But after it was realized that we should, uh, this, this, uh, this is, these limits are based on the assumption that the uh, blazers uh, were like constantly during this observation time, right? So they accounted for the time delay and the uh, limits went down. Here it is, these two papers, following 2011 papers, which claim it the limits are lower, right? So here. Uh, now you will tell me how they are measuring these magnetic fields. So the blazers um, like have the ultra high uh, photons, right? In TV range, for example, these photons are propagating. They are producing the cascade, electron positron cascade. And after if there will be uh, the magnetic field, um, then uh, the positrons and electrons will be uh, def deflected in the different angles because of their charge different sign, right? So here it is <clears throat> another paper, which was also in 2011. And this paper was a numerical simulation by Dolok and his group members. And what they claiming here, if you see, can you see the summary? So here it is written that if, sorry. So as uh, there is a, some uh, kind of the unknown, unknown effective process of the astrophysical uh, process to generate these fields in the voids, or we should uh, admit that, that probably it is a primordial origin of the magnetic fields. The problem, it is not only the correlation lens, which is a quite big, but also it is uh, the filling factors in these voids for this field. So you can produce from the galactic winds this such a kind of the amplitude of the magnetic field with the same correlation lens, but it will be too difficult to produce um, to produce the filling factors of this field as it is observed, right? So, and this is a, a more recent uh, paper, right? Which is, was published by the Veritas collaboration in 2017. And if you can see here, they said that mm, these blazer spectra are um, affected at the scales larger than 10 megaparsecs and uh, from their source. So it, it will be probably, uh, we are dealing with cosmologically generated magnetic fields. So magnetogenesis in the early universe, this was started by the paper by Fermi in 49, developed further by Hoyle in 58, and uh, there is uh, basically, I will be focusing on the two scenarios. One, it is an inflationary one, and another one, cosmological phase transition. So in the case of the inflation, the advantage it is that your correlation lens can be as large as you want. And the magnetic field is produced uh, during the inflationary stages uh, through the quantum mechanical fluctuations. Uh, in most inflationary magnetogenesis models, uh, the spectrum is scale invariant. And the uh, generated magnetic field strange will agree very well with uh, lower bounds for the magnetic field. Ha however, there is uh, several disadvantages of the inflationary magnetogenesis. So you sometimes need to assume that there is a symmetry breaking, fundamental symmetry breaking. And also there might be the strong coupling and the reaction problem. On the phase transition, um, there is a many models of the generate magnetic fields. Uh, it can be mm, non-helical and helical. It can come from the, mm, from the bubble collisions. It can even come through the QCD phase transition through the axionic production. Uh, these fields, of course, are now causal and their uh, correlation lens cannot exceed, due to the causality, the Hubble lens scales at the moment of their generation, right? 
So now if we will test the, if we will can make the observation, which gives us the option to distinguish when these magnetic fields were generated, right? Then it will give us the possibility to test the physics through the magnetic fields at the very early epoch, right? So if, the, if, if it will be shown that the magnetic field comes through the inflation, this will be inflationary time scales. If it comes from the phase transition, it will be in phase transition scales, right? Now, why is the uh, primordial magnetohydrodynamical turbulence? So, the, as I said, this uh, primordial magnetogenesis concepts was developed uh, long ago. There was uh, many papers studying the imprints of these cosmological magnetic fields. Uh, but in all these papers, uh, was assumed that the magnetic field, it is just frozen in the plasma and uh, its uh, amplitude just is diluted during the expansion of the universe, right? However, as I said, that early universe plasma is a perfect conductor, and there is a quite strong coupling between the fluid and the magnetic field itself, and then your magnetic fields will be changing its configuration. So here it is uh, uh, our first numerical simulations done in 2010 uh, based on the Axel Brandenburg's uh, code pencil when we injected the magnetic energy at some given scales and uh, let this um, magnetic energy uh, to decay freely right so as we can see these dashed lines are the velocity field so magnetic field will produce simultaneously the um, uh, kinetic motions of the fluid and the spectrum, which was uh, approximated as a delta function. So it was like monochromatic magnetic field will be redistributed quite uh, soon and we will get the spreading of the spectrum at all wave numbers, right? On the large and small one, right? So also, uh, as I said, that the early universe, uh, both inflation and the phase transition, can offer the possibility to violate the um, symmetry, a parity symmetry, and such violation of the symmetry can be manifested through the magnetic helicity. So we know that uh, magnetic fields on the, of the sun are helical. So here it is. Um, schematic uh, magnetic fields line, uh, which are twisted. And in fact, helicity it is not uh, local. It is a global quantity. It can be determined through the integral average uh, product of the vector potential with the magnetic field itself. And uh, there is uh, several um, magnetogenesis models in which the generation of the magnetic helicity in the early universe can be associated to the baryogenesis and leptogenesis. And also there is this chiral magnetic effect uh, during which due to the difference in the chemical potentials, uh, you can get the chiral magnetic field in the early universe also, right? So here it is, uh, I will uh, show how the evolution of the magnetic fields looks. So initially you had uh, magnetic fields, which was um, like on the small correlation lens and through the decay, the amplitude of the magnetic fields is decaying with some uh, typical laws while the correlation lens of the magnetic field is increasing, right? So you definitely see that the amplitude is decreasing, but the correlation length is increasing, right? So the final stages of this one will be showing that the magnetic fields cover all the simulation box, right? Now, also we have realized that there is a fractional growth of fractional helicities growth. So if there is a magnetic helicity, even partial, it happens that um, 
due to the conservation and redistribution of this magnetic field and through the decay processes, the uh, uh, correlation length is increasing, uh, you will get that effect effectively you will get uh, the increase of the fractional helicity and after some time the field which was uh, weakly helical became fully helical but it takes some kind of the time so this is a snapshot to evolution of this helicity right so in 2017 based on all numerical simulations that we have done uh, Axel Branderburg and I we published in PRL the paper about the uh, general classes of the hydro and magnetohydrodynamical turbulence. So we uh, we split it in the three classes. One, it is hydrodynamical. So the blue lines in all these pictures corresponds to the kinetic um, motions, while the red one corresponds to the magnetic one. So for the hydrodynamical, as we can see, the correlation length is increasing, but the power spectrum just follows these lines, nothing else. Now on the helical magnetic field, we see the conservation of the helicity. So we have just moving of the um, peak frequencies as correlation lengths on the left, right? And in the middle, it is, was something that was not known before uh, that uh, for the non-helical fields, we do have the inverse transferring of the energy to the large scales but it is not so strong as for the helical one. So uh, the story when we published this paper was long because referee did not believe it. He said, oh, you did not wait long enough. Probably if you wait long enough, your picture will be completely different. So we let the turbulence decay for the long period. And also we made this kind of the compensated rescaled spectra which definitely uh, shows that the picture is completely stable. So uh, now if we account for this, uh, these processes, uh, we can start with a magnetic field at electroweak or QCD phase transition and energy density of the magnetic field cannot exceed 10% of the total energy, radiation energy, otherwise, uh, expansion of the universe will be go to the different rate and you will not have the time to, to make the mm, nucleosynthesis. And you know that there is a data about the lithium evidence in the universe. So uh, if the field magnetic field is um, stronger than 10 minus six, so I mean the moving uh, moving value of the amplitude Gauss today, then this field will be ruling out the nucleosynthesis. So 10 minus six Gauss, it is just the BBN limits here, right? So also we assume that the both electroweak and QCD phase transition produce the causal magnetic field. So the correlation lengths of the magnetic field cannot exceed the Hubble horizon, and after we let this correlation lens increase either through the um, helical cascade or inverse cascade or through the non-helical inverse transfer that we have found. So here it is, uh, um, this line corresponds to the moment of the recombination after which the um, process of the coupling of the magnetic field and um, and fluid stops because uh, uh, like uh, we do have the like natural um, universe now and uh, till the moment of the reionization, the magnetic field really stays uh, frozen in, right? So as we can see from the, the same kind of the magnetic field values, even if we measure it through the CMB or through the blazer spectra, can give you the different uh, uh, magnetogenesis scenarios, right? So this is the difficulties. So we wish to have something more clean and more correctly determine the mechanism how this magnetic field was generated. So here it is um, 
uh, one of the option to make such a props, it is using the gravitational waves astronomy. So we know that gravitational waves propagate freely and almost freely. And they retain the information about the physical um, characteristic of the source. So we uh, can, if we measure this uh, relic gravitational waves, we will know what it is a characteristic scale of the source, what it is the strength of this source. So based on these numerical simulations, which I will address just in a minute, uh, we found that the energy density of the gravitational waves is proportional to the energy density of the magnetic field squared, right? Because uh, the source, it is like proportional to the V square, right? And uh, then we have averaging of the, for the gravitational waves, we have, uh, we should square this one, so it will be fourth power of the magnetic field. So here also we found that frequency it is um, twice the typical frequency of the source. And this frequency can be connected with the number of the magnetic eddies or the bubble size, right? So wishing the Hubble radius, right? So for the first order electronic phase transition, such a number it is around 100, 100 bubs wishing the uh, linear Hubble scales, while for the QCD one, we have five or six, right? So this will be really amazing to get such a magnetic field to be detected, right? So, but uh, this was applying to the causal magnetic field. And as for the inflationary one, we get the scale invariant spectrum. And also we uh, have that the correlation lens can be as large as possible, right? So the most power it is going to the small wave number. So this is a spectrum. And as the magnetic field, can interact with the plasma only wishing the Hubble horizon, which is shown here, right? Uh, so now uh, uh, what it was our numerical simulation. So we worked on the co-moving uh, coordinate, right? Uh, and uh, we also done conformal time instead of the physical time and uh, co-moving amplitude of the gravitational waves, right? So we consider two stages basically, but we see after that there is a really three stages, uh, the force of turbulence and free decay of the turbulence. So here it is this uh, nonlinear compressible MHD equations. And here it is our gravitational waves equation, which was rewritten in the form of the, in the community coordinate by Grishuk in 74. By the way, I should mention that um, first uh, paper about the generation of the gravitational waves by the magnetic sources was described by Diriagin, uh, Sajin and um, Sajin uh, paper and Rubakov paper in 86, right? So quite long ago. Of course, it was analytical without uh, making any assumption about uh, like exact frequency and so on, right? So here it was something that we do not know still. And this is a work in the progress uh, for, uh, we don't know why, but the acoustic turbulence, it is more uh, effective to produce a gravitational wave than the magnetic one. So here it is the evolution of the both of them. So as you see here, the um, strength of the gravitational waves are stronger than for the magnetic uh, vertical turbulence, right? So we do not know what it is the reason, but we are trying to like investigate this one. So uh, here it is uh, many runs. So Alberto uh, was leading this work in 2019. So here we describe what was the initial strength of the magnetic field, what was its uh, um, 
helicity. We also separately consider the acoustic kind of the turbulence. By the way, I will say that this effectiveness was found uh, also by the Heidmarsh, Heidmarsh uh, and others papers also. So we are in the very good agreement. However, neither of papers gives us the physical explanation of these processes. So here it is uh, also from the Albertos and our papers, how the looks uh, final gravitational waves uh, compared to the um, source, uh, source um, energy density spectrum. So here we do have the causal uh, part of the any turbulent, um, uh, any turbulent sources, right? Magnetohydrodynamical. On the other side, we have the Kolmogoro one, and the, at very high uh, frequencies, we do have the just viscous damping. So the gravitational waves uh, produce the spectrum is shown here, and what it is interesting is that in the in the region of the high frequency, the obtaining uh, scaling of the gravitational waves uh, corresponds to those which we found analytically, but no of the previous studies found out this kind of the plateau. What this means? So it means that if you just move slightly your uh, energy scales where the gravitational waves are productive, uh, they will be still uh, possible to detect them, right? So since, for example, I will show the detection prospects as well, of course. So here it is compared to the uh, LISA. Here it is a LISA sensitivity and here it is uh, gravitational waves with uh, different initial conditions. So we see directly the amplitude and the frequency, peak frequency of gravitational waves contains the information about the source, right? So for example, if the uh, phase transition would happen to the like higher energy, right? The prospect of the detection through this existence of this plateau will be better, right? Than was estimated previously. So here it is also correspondence and we definitely see that this how acoustic it is more efficient, even more efficient than the helical sources, right? So now you will say how you will detect these gravitational waves uh, coming from these uh, early times because uh, it is definitely a lot of the, um, additional uh, foregrounds, astrophysical foregrounds, and how you will split them. So at the frequency of the LISA, uh, the foregrounds, uh, it is the supermassive black holes and also the void dwarfs. And void dwarfs are many, so they will produce you the stochastic signal as well. So this paper, it is like a textbook, I would say about this living review about uh, detection methods for the stochastic gravitational waves backgrounds by Romano and Cornish. And here it is some um, quote from this paper. Uh, so here it is written that uh, distinguishing between the foregrounds, astrophysical foregrounds and cosmological gravitational waves might be based on the consideration of the Gaussianity and how it is partially distributed the signal. So of course, due to the, our proper motion, the signal will be gravitation, stochastic gravitational wave signal coming from, from like early universe will be some, somehow affected. And uh, uh, as it was uh, shown, this effect can be uh, used uh, to remove this astrophysical foreground. So this is a more recent paper in the September. Uh, and they also are talking about the gravitational waves from the early universe and how to remove the foregrounds, right? So now, interestingly, so Nerono, Alberto, Caprini and um, Semikos, they have considered 
recently, like in the October 2020, the possibility that the uh, signal of the gravitational, I mean, signal of uh, detected by the nanograph can be explained by the QCD phase transition generated magnetic fields. So here it is um, a picture showing and uh, the signals, right? And the different parameters of the QCD uh, and the spectrum of gravitational waves. And this gives you the option to detect them, right? So here it is again, the improved uh, picture of the lower bounds. And also here it is this um, nanograph results. On the other side, you have the Faraday rotation and cosmic microwave background radiation. So, of course, this there is a, uh, like dozens of the different explanation of these detected nanograph signals, including the gravitational waves from the inflation, from the string, or through the, of course, the supermassive black holes, right? So now I am switching in the remaining period about the circular polarization. As I said, in 2005, we are considered the helical turbulence uh, and we define it the polarization through the ratio of the left uh, and right-handed um, gravitational waves to the total energy density. So here it is the expression that we adopted in 2005. And it was in fact adopted from the description of the polarization, gravitational polarization coming from the um, different sources like um, phase transition with the neutron stars. So now uh, it was in 2015, we made a better uh, consideration. So in the 10 years, the numerical simulation options was improved. So this parameter H corresponds here, what it is the fractional helicity. And if H is equals one, then we get fully helical sources, right? So on these pictures, about we do have this plateau stuff that we claim it to be due to the inverse transfer. And we said that this is not like Kolmogorov turbulence, but it is something which um, is um, due to the like um, helicity transports in any case, right? So now the same, but again, I just say, all these previous papers always assume that the turbulence is a stationary. And based on the same kind of the assumption, uh, Ellis et al. in 2020, they made the uh, consideration and then in fact reproduced, uh, you see the figures are quite similar. And this is also quite similar for the helical case, right? So you see, right? HT means helical turbulence, HK means a helical Kolmogorov turbulence, right? So there was a perfect agreement between um, uh, these papers, results, and uh, this Ellis and all results, or these results was used to estimate the option to detect the gravitational waves polarization, right? So uh, now uh, in the, our numerical simulations, recent one, so I submitted the paper like uh, two weeks, three weeks ago uh, in November. And so we uh, considered that there is a, in fact, different stages of the gravitational waves generation. First it is overshooting uh, after there is a, like stationary turbulence and after there is a decay of the turbulence. So here it is interestingly that during the stationary turbulence time, the increase of the gravitational waves energy density this corresponds completely the same as we had in the in case of, um, uh, of our analytical considerations through the stationary turbulence. However, your stationary turbulence cannot last long. 
right? So there is no any mechanism which will pump the energy to the like phase transition plasma. Uh, then uh, here it is showing when we artificially prolongate the stationary period, right? And we definitely see how this is a mm, dissipation rate. Here it is a gravitational energy growth rate. And here it is uh, uh, like spectrum describing the source itself, right? So, and uh, just to be clear, we decided to make everything here normalized to the same amplitude of the source range, right? So based on this one, we said, okay, so the results which was obtained previously co uh, corresponds only to the stationary turbulence and let's see how this affects the polarization degree. So here again, I plot the uh, like results from the uh, Ellison old paper, which is a new one. And this is the sort of the artificial helical turbulence, which is not realized through the um, like realistic scenarios of the magnetic field generation. While on the um, uh, right hand side, you see how this will look like uh, for, the, um, for the realistic turbulence, right? When uh, the solution was done self-consistently numerically, right? So we definitely see that there is a big difference between these two, right? So we never will get the fully polarized uh, gravitational waves at um, uh, like large wave numbers. Uh, because here it is sort of the dumping. And also the uh, like scale here is different from this one. Uh, this was a low resolution. It was just to checking if it is everything working properly. So now this is a from the papers that I have submitted in the collaboration with Axel, Alberto, Giga, and Cheyenne, right? So here it is uh, interesting stuff, which occurs here. So the upper uh, co corresponds to the kinetic source, hydrodynamical helical sources, while the uh, bottom one corresponds to the uh, magnetic helical sources. So we definitely see that there is a sort of a difference at the large scales. Uh, uh, at small scales, almost everything is uh, similar. So uh, we claim in this recent papers that increase of the polarization, completely different from what was uh, predicted previously, is due to the inverse transfer of the uh, power at the large scales, right? Presence of the helicity just induced. Even if you have partially helical, you have some increase. So this error bar shows uh, accuracy of the numerical simulations. The resolution was done uh, 1052 cube for compressible MHD. It is quite time consuming, by the way. So now you tell me, OK, this uh, uh, proof that your idea about the inverse cascade is correct. So we have done uh, this kind of the testing, and we definitely see that um, increase of the polarization at uh, small wave number large scales is due to the presence of the magnetic helicity. In fact, that way, if there ever will be the polarization detected, you can distinguish very uh, well if this source is um, like hydrodynamically dom uh, dominant, kinetically dominant, or the magnetically dominant, right? Which uh, just uh, uh, like just consideration of the gravitational waves amplitude does not give this option, right? So here it is also snapshots how this uh, gravitational waves polarization looks like. And here as the most exciting piece, uh, so in 2007, 
Seto and collaborators published a number of the papers in which they said that uh, laser interferometer space antenna can measure uh, or ground based can measure gravitational wave polarization accounting from the our proper motions. So this idea was first developed by mm, Domke and others, right? So this is uh, uh, this paper. It is uh, in October last year, right? And here it is their abstract in which they are saying that we can detect the polarized gravitational waves if the mm, strength of the energy density is 10 minus 11, definitely under the range of the laser sensitivity. And the, this one is based on the damaged uh, spectrum because of the solar system's motion toward, uh, towards the, the stochastic background, right? Like if you have the dipolar modulations for the cosmic microwave background radiations, the same might happen for the gravitational waves, and this opens the prospects to detect the polarization itself. So now, again, uh, so uh, this is a paper by Seto that I just mentioned. So they, they said that if uh, we do dipolar anisotropy, this will be option to detect through the uh, laser interferometer space antenna or Einstein telescope. But if we do the ground-based for the reasons of the frequency distribution, then the curvature of the Earth might give the same kind of um, effect, right? So again, it is this paper, 2019. And here it is uh, uh, this more recent paper by Elis et al., which I just done. So the, again, their detection prospects was fully based on the assumption that the polarization spectra of, were obtained through this stationary turbulence description, which we have shown that it is not the realistic one. So they plotted now the detection prospect of the polarization itself through the laser abilities, but again, the theoretical methodological aspects of this one, uh, it is non correct because of the stationarity assumption, right? So now I can switch to the uh, conclusion. So, first, I will say that if we do have primordial turbulence and primordial magnetic fields, this will be a good seat for the observed magnetic fields in the voids, right? So uh, if we assume the presence of this magnetic field, it will increase as uh, detection prospect of the induced gravitational waves uh, because of the spreading the range of the detectable frequency. Also, uh, LISA definitely offers us the uh, um, option to detect the gravitational waves from the phase transition and also uh, in the peak uh, for the parity violation, uh, violating sources, right? We will have 100% polarization, but only on the peak, right? So this will give you option to, uh, uh, I will show once more, right? So this corresponds to the peak of the mm, source itself, right? So this will give you the option to detect uh, like what was the uh, peak position what was the source and uh, what was uh, like um, characteristic, like what it is uh, correlation length, uh, because it will be go to the, to the frequency. So by the way, this is a figure from the Domsk et al showing this dipolar anisotropy due to the, our proper motion, right? Uh, so, and that's all. And thank you very much again for your attention and inviting me. All right. Any questions? Uh, since nobody's asking, maybe I, may I ask one question? Yes. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the pariogenesis. Do you assume some particular mechanism of this pariogenesis of what? Uh... I'm just saying that we observe, yeah. uh, this is uh, based on the recent paper by Long and co-authors, 
Andrew Long and co-authors in which they are saying that we definitely see the um, asymmetry in the matter and antimatter. So this uh, might be related to the, the, this might be related to the helical magnetic fields, primordial magnetic fields of the universe. So he said that the, uh, the one source it is of this biogenesis for the asymmetry of the matter and antimatter and the uh, magnetic fields. No, I mean, there is, I don't know any mechanism which really works till to the end, but that's why I'm asking which mechanism you assume, but it's okay, we can discuss later. Yes. All right. Well, thanks very much, Tina, for the interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting.